I'm not a scientist, but I really enjoy science. I've always enjoyed my science classes when I was in school, and I think science has shown its usefulness by helping us to create the technology that we use every day to improve our lives. I also really like The Cosmos, both the original with Carl Sagan and the more recent one with Neil deGrasse Tyson. So you'll understand how shocked I was to discover these men aren't gods! Oh, the torment! How will I go on when my whole world has been shattered? How will I possibly live in a world where scientists are people who sometimes make mistakes and aren't treated as omniscient gods? Whatever will I do now but rip out my eyeballs and cover my ears, shouting la 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 la, I can't hear you, to anyone who dares question the almighty power of Neil deGrasse Tyson. And I owe it all to naturalnews.com. Thank you for freeing me of my delusional deification of these scientists. Except, oh wait, that's right. I never once thought that these two men are great and wise sages chocked full of wisdom. I just see them as intelligent people, like any others, with all the same flaws as everyone else. So I found this article to be quite entertaining. The article, if you can even call it that, from naturalnews.com is titled, Neil deGrasse Tyson joins the list of world's most evil propagandists who push poison in the name of science. The article is from a few days ago, but as far as I can tell, it doesn't seem to be prompted by anything. Nothing in the article is new information at all. Nothing was even really recent. All of this information is about stuff that happened years ago, so I have no idea why this was published now, but it was, so let's take a look at it. So it's a fairly short article that basically makes a couple of claims. First, it says Neil deGrasse Tyson lies about shit all the time. It gives a couple of examples, which in all fairness is enough to prove that Tyson isn't omniscient. But I think all reasonable people were already aware of that. It doesn't, however, prove that he lies all the time, or even that his mistakes were intentional and meant to deceive and not just fuck-ups that could have quite possibly kept Tyson up at night after discovering that he had made these mistakes. First example it gives is from a 2003 speech where Tyson claims George Bush said something after 9-11 that he never actually said, which is a fair thing to call him out on, but it doesn't just stop there. If it had, we might be dealing with an article written by a rational person, but alas, that's not the case. The article claims that not a single thing that Tyson said about Bush during the speech was in any way true, and yet nobody in the mainstream media called him out for this. For that matter, neither did any of his followers, most of whom were probably awestruck just to be able to hear their science god utter words from his own mouth. Any of his followers? Any of them? Are you sure? I mean, I guess it depends on what you call a follower. If you mean, like, fans or Twitter followers, then you're absolutely fucking mistaken. I've actually heard about this misquote from a friend of mine who's a fan of Tyson, so to claim that none of them called him out is nonsense. Unless by followers you mean people who think of Tyson as an omniscient god, but I don't think those people are all that common. I think this article is just trying to paint all of Tyson's fans as mindless followers who believe everything he says. Which actually says a lot more about what naturalnews.com thinks of its readers and their ability to research. It only takes about five seconds to Google it and find Tyson admitting his mistake. So that and the other mistake was about half the article, but the other half is what the article was really all about. It talks about GMOs and basically claims that Tyson is just a stooge who is shilling for biotech companies like Monsanto. It does this not by showing any link between GMOs and any negative effect on health or environment, but instead by personal attacks against Tyson. And it does this by quoting TruthWiki. Because TruthWiki is a perfectly reliable source, and not just a site full of conspiratorial nonsense. Except, oh wait, that's exactly what it is. But anyway, here is the quote. Genetically modified food with dangerous organisms that would never find their way into seeds of the food that humans eat is extremely unethical. Even the process of artificial selection has nothing to do with biotechnology, where the latter involves inserting the genes of foreign living things into the seeds of a crop in order to kill weeds and insects for profit. Okay, okay. So there's a lot to unpack here. First, we have to separate the technology itself from the actions of individuals and companies. That is to say, if I want to claim something is dangerous, let's just say airplanes, for example, I would have to show that air travel is unsafe, and I can't just give one example of a shitty airline mismanaging air traffic and causing a plane to crash. And I also can't just use an example of the technology being used for nefarious purposes, like 9-11, for instance. So I can't say that planes are unsafe because of 9-11, and GMOs are much the same way. If someone is using them to poison people by creating food that contains substances toxic to people, that doesn't mean all GMOs are bad, the same way that terrorists who fly planes into buildings doesn't show that all planes are bad. Nor do unintentional plane crashes show that planes are harmful, so long as the plane crashes are extremely unlikely or caused by operator error that can be avoided. In which case, stricter policies on pilots should be considered, but banning air travel isn't a proper solution. 
since it wouldn't have been the planes, but rather the people flying them, which would mean that with more skilled pilots, the technology would be able to be used effectively without lots of crashes. And again, GMOs are the same way. If Monsanto or another company created a crop that accidentally kills butterflies, that doesn't mean all GMOs destroy the environment, but rather that we must use the technology more carefully. We need experts who take their time and understand the consequences of different decisions, the same as we do for pilots. So when they say inserting the genes of foreign living things into the seeds of crops in order to kill weeds or insects for profit, all I hear is someone who has a lot of complaints but doesn't really know why. If the problem is with inserting insecticides or pesticides into the crops, then the problem isn't GMOs, but insecticides or pesticides, because you could create GMOs without ever doing those things. So if they're the problem, then it doesn't make sense to blame the technology, no more than it makes sense to blame planes for 9-11. Similarly, we don't blame the knives for killing a victim, we blame the killer, who chose to use the knife in such a terrible way. And banning those things will cause more harm than good, since most of the people who want to use a knife aren't doing so to kill someone. Similarly, most scientists probably don't want to poison everyone, so banning a useful tool like genetic modification might stop the bad or poisonous modifications, but it'll also stop any beneficial or potentially beneficial modifications. But without banning them, we could potentially just set restrictions that'll allow for safe modifications and prevent harmful ones. That way we can get the benefit of the technology with much less of the risk if we do it right. The quote also ends with the fact that it's for profit. But this too isn't a GMO problem, but a capitalist one. The question of whether we should or shouldn't be allowed to patent organisms is a valid discussion, but it doesn't say anything about the usefulness or potential risk of GMOs, so it's not useful to the discussion of whether or not GMOs are safe or harmful. So it seems that the article doesn't like GMOs, not because the process of genetic modification is inherently bad or risky, but instead because evil corporate fat cats got rich creating plants that contain scary sounding chemicals. Which, to me, sounds like a problem with Monsanto and other biotech companies, and not the technology itself. But rather than targeting their outrage at the ones responsible, they create a boogeyman out of the technology. This, to me, seems extremely irresponsible, just as it would be irresponsible to advocate banning airplanes after 9-11. Not wanting people to fly planes into buildings isn't the same as not wanting planes, and not wanting Monsanto to create poisonous crops with GM technology is not the same as not wanting any crops created with GM technology. And the real issue here is that none of this actually addresses whether the crops really are dangerous. Sometimes people point out the fact that several countries have banned GMOs. However, some countries have banned them for fear of negative economic impact, not necessarily health and environmental concerns. But also, plenty of countries have banned books. And I think most people would agree that this is a stupid reason for us to ban books too just because everyone else is doing it. So this isn't proof of anything, but the ineptitude of bureaucracies and politics to discern the truth. As they say, there's no truth in politics, which is why I think we need to use science. So what does science have to say on the matter? Well, according to Scientific American, although it may seem creepy to add virus DNA to a plant, doing so is in fact no big deal. Proponents say viruses have been inserting their DNA into the genome of crops as well as humans and all other organisms for millions of years. They often deliver the genes of other species while they're at it, which is why our own genome is loaded with genetic sequences that originated in viruses and non-human species. When GM critics say that genes don't cross the species barrier in nature, that's just simple ignorance. The article also addresses the issue of research being funded by biotech companies like Monsanto and says, critics often disparage U.S. research on the safety of genetically modified foods, which is often funded or even conducted by GM companies such as Monsanto, but much research on the subject comes from the European Commission, the administrative body of the EU, which cannot be so easily dismissed as the industry tool. The European Commission has funded 130 research papers carried out by more than 500 independent teams on the safety of GM crops. None of those studies found any risk from GM crops. So in other words, we have no evidence of any inherent risk beyond that of conventional crops for GM technology. But not because no research has been conducted, but to the contrary, many studies have been done, and yet none have shown any risk from GM technologies, with the exception of a few that have been debunked, such as the Ciralini study that claimed a link between GM corn and mice with cancer. But this study was proven to be faulty for having too low of a sample size, among other issues as well. 
But the Scientific American article is a little old, so it may be useful to look at something more recent. Last year, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine released the most comprehensive study on GMOs to date. I'll leave a link in the description if you're interested, but from the website, you can download the whole report. When you follow the link, it asks us if you want to buy a paperback copy for like 90 bucks, but over on the side, there should be a little button that says download the free PDF. The whole thing is like 600 pages, so it's a really long read, but I'll just read you part of the conclusion of the study. Some emerging genetic engineering technologies are likely to create new crop varieties that are indistinguishable from those developed by conventional plant breeding, whereas other technologies, such as mutagenesis, that are not covered by existing laws, could create new crop varieties with substantial changes to plant phenotypes. The size and extent of the genetic transformation has relatively little relevance on the extent of the changes in the plant and subsequently to the risk that it poses to the environment or to food safety. The committee recommends the development of a tiered approach to regulation that is based not on the breeding process, but on consideration of novelty, potential hazard, and exposure as criteria. The application of omics technologies can help to provide greater assurance that no unintended differences have been introduced by whatever breeding technique is used. So the recommendation by the National Academy of Sciences is to essentially regulate the food industry, but rather than banning GMOs or focusing only on GM technology, instead they recommend focusing on the riskiness of the crop itself, regardless of the technique used, which to me seems like a logical solution, at least until we discover more. I don't agree with those that say the debate is over because the science is in, because I think science is a process and not a static thing, so the research will never truly be over as long as there's potentially more to be learned. So I don't think that this in any way settles the issue. However, the more data we have that finds no link, the more certain we can be that no strong link exists, since if it did, we probably would have found it by now, unless the link is so small as to be unnoticeable except at the largest scales, but then the risk is so small it almost doesn't need to be considered. So until there's sufficient evidence to warrant belief that GMOs are unhealthy or inherently riskier to the environment than traditional crops, I have to conclude that GMOs are no more risky than conventional crops. The fact is that hundreds of independent studies have been done that all concluded there's no inherent risk to GMOs over the ordinary risk from breeding and consuming crops with conventional methods. However, if that day ever comes that we do have that evidence, I'll change my mind, as I expect scientists like Neil deGrasse Tyson will do as well. But maybe I'm wrong. But until we have data to the contrary, I just won't know for sure. Thanks for watching. Please rate this video and leave a comment. And if you enjoyed my work, please subscribe to my channel. You can also follow me on social media. The links are in the description. Thanks for watching and remember to never stop questioning.